wonderful to see so many people joining us virtually today. This strong showing is indicative of the interest in innovations and technologies that can make highways and our whole transportation system safer and more efficient. I'm Mala Parker, Deputy Administrator of the Federal Highway Administration. On behalf of the agency, thank you all for being here. We have an exciting program planned for this afternoon. You'll be hearing from U.S. Transportation Secretary Elaine L. Chow and a panel featuring a few of our stakeholder organizations, as well as, of course, learning about our new round of innovation. But first, it is my pleasure to introduce Federal Highway Administrator Nicole Nason. Ms. Nason began her tenure as Administrator of the Federal Highway Administration on April 22, 2019. In this role, she leads a modal administration within the department that is responsible for the nation's $49 billion federal aid highway program. Previously, she was assistant secretary of the U.S. State Department's Bureau of Administration from December 2017 to March 2019. Administrator Nason arrived at FHWA with knowledge of the department and transportation issues since she served notably as administrator of the department's National Highway Traffic Safety Administration from 2006 to 2008. And now, Federal Highway Administrator Nicole Nason. Thank you, Mala. Thank you for that kind introduction, but more importantly, thank you for your support and your leadership at this agency for the last uh, 20 months, I guess, close to, that we've been going. It's been a heck of an experience, and I have been really, really appreciative to have you standing right there with me as we navigate all of these interesting challenges. And I want to say good morning to everyone, uh, good afternoon to everyone, and, and say thank you to all of you and tell you how much I appreciate that you are here with us today, all of our state and local and tribal stakeholder partners for our EBC sixth round. We are, we are sad that we can't do this in person, but glad that we found a way to manage virtually. And I need to give a special shout out before I do anything else to our panelists. So Rich and Jim and Donna, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are helping to make this a success today and, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. And I'm excited to work with all of you, but Really, all of FHWA is excited to work with all of you to continue advancing innovations through this sixth round of EDC for 2021 and 22. We appreciate the challenges that all of you have been going through this year. We have been managing the same challenges, the difficulties of having a workforce that is almost exclusively working from home the difficulties of navigating 50 different governors, uh, rules and requirements, and of course, uh, countless city council directives regarding the public health emergency, and finding a way to keep projects moving, to keep the public moving, because so many people are essential and really do need to be going to work. And so how do we continue to advance transportation? And now, as so many of you have told me, uh, the challenges regarding decreases in revenue. I was joking with someone the other day, except it's not really such a joke, that EDC could just as easily stand for every dollar counts because we know that everyone is watching their revenue and their budgets very, very carefully. So I feel personally that now more than ever, innovation is critical. Innovation is going to be the way that we advance and we advance for the public, for our stakeholders, all of our stakeholders, the American public. And so I'm very thankful that we are able to have this announcement today. And, and I, what was important to me as we were moving forward was that we, we look forward thematically, that we focus on the now, even though we originally sought uh, requests before the national health emergency, really the global health public health emergency. We wanna focus on making sure that we are living in today's reality and EDC is going to be useful to our stakeholders and our partners. So I wanna give credit to uh, our AA 
at Turner Fairbank for research and development, Kelly Regal, who came up with our theme, innovation for a nation on the move. And it was important to me that it's not just a tagline, it's a theme. How do we take our EDC um, choices and make sure they fit with the theme that we are a nation on the move. We are not a nation that has stopped advancing transportation, even though these are incredibly unusual times, we are still serving the public and we're being ever mindful with our tax dollars. So uh, Kelly Regal really helped, I think, define for us the fact that we are a nation on the move, but still innovating. And, and you'll see that um, our innovations are going to fall into three buckets. They either explore ways to better engage people which was a priority for the leadership of the department or featuring products to enhance and preserve our infrastructure or improving our processes to gain efficiencies. And those are three ways that we thought we could think about, we could frame this round of EDC. So thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for your leadership and continuing to advance innovation. Thank you for everything that you have done and you will continue to do for uh, the traveling public. And Mala, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Administrator. Next, we have a special message from U.S. Department of Transportation Secretary Elaine L. Chow. Welcome to the launch of the next round of the Everyday Counts program. We all have common goals, to learn from one another, to find new ways to leverage our collective resources, and to make transportation infrastructure as safe, reliable, and strong as possible. Everyday Counts can help. It is a stakeholder-driven initiative, providing state, local, and tribal transportation leaders with opportunities to learn about ready to deploy innovations that best fit their individual needs. This summit is an opportunity to leverage the expertise and experience of our staff, as well as your colleagues and peers. These are invaluable resources. As you know so well, transportation is the backbone of our economy and keeping our supply chains safe, open, and operational has been the department's highest priorities during the current health challenges. And I know that it's at the top of your list as well. The initiatives you will hear about in this next round of Everyday Counts include the following, exploring ways to better engage people, including the transportation workforce. Highlighting products with good potential to enhance our infrastructure if used more widely. And showcasing opportunities to improve processes that will save time for transportation agencies, industry, and the traveling public we all serve. So thank you for joining us. We look forward to the presentations and conversations that will lay the foundation for our future collaboration and cooperation. Thank you. Secretary's remarks provide a great introduction for our main event, the announcement of seven initiatives that FHWA has selected for the sixth round of Everyday Counts. But before we do that, I'd like to thank those of you who engaged with us during the call for ideas and submitted suggested topics. We received more than 100 suggestions, which really illustrates the interest in fostering innovation in the transportation industry. All of us have a role to play and a voice to share. Coming up with a final roster of innovations is always a challenge for us, but it's a good challenge to have, and we think you'll find something in this group of initiatives that will make a positive impact in your program. So without further ado, let's roll the video.
Reliable modern infrastructure provides good quality of life for Americans and supports economic growth. The Federal Highway Administration's Everyday Counts program, known as EDC, is a state-based program to rapidly deploy proven technologies and processes that boost safety and efficiency. EDC Round 6 highlights the power of people in transportation, new applications of products to save money, and new processes to save time. Agencies can collect real-time crowdsourced data wherever people travel, between sensors, in rural regions, along arterials, and beyond jurisdictional boundaries. Crowdsourced data can be used to optimize roadway use by reducing congestion and increasing safety and reliability. Public involvement is critical in the transportation decision-making process because it creates meaningful communication with the public. Virtual public involvement tools like project visualizations, mobile applications, and all-in-one tools help agencies gather valuable feedback to improve transportation. The demand for highway construction workers is growing, and emerging technologies in the transportation industry require new skills. The Strategic Workforce Development Initiative includes strategies and resources to promote jobs in transportation and provide career preparation to a new audience. Next generation traffic incident management programs help shorten the impact of roadway incidents and improve the safety of motorists, crash victims, and responders. New tools such as unmanned aircraft systems, data analytics, and computer-aided dispatch systems help agencies better detect and manage traffic incidents. Highway construction projects generate massive amounts of valuable data that historically were communicated via paper. Transportation agencies can save time and improve safety by using e-ticketing and digital as-builts. Electronic ticketing improves the tracking, exchange, and archiving of materials tickets. Digital as-builts include utilities and other subsurface information to support future operations maintenance, and asset management. New applications for proven products can help agencies maintain roadways with limited funding. One is ultra-high-performance concrete, commonly used for prefabricated bridge elements. Bridge preservation and repair is a new application for UHPC. It offers superior strength, enhanced performance, and improved life cycle cost over traditional methods. Pavement overlays represent a significant portion of highway infrastructure dollars. Targeted overlay pavement solutions allow highway agencies to retain the value of existing pavements in need of treatment. Cost-effective asphalt and concrete overlay applications improve safety and performance. They also shorten construction time, extend service life, and enhance user satisfaction. The power of people, new applications of products, and new processes can save your agency time, money, and lives. Learn more about EDC6 on the FHWA website. What an excellent overview. We hope you're all excited to learn more about these initiatives in the coming days. And if you'd like to watch that video again or share it with your colleagues or stakeholders, it will be available on our EDC6 website, along with other information about these seven new initiatives. Earlier, I mentioned the engagement we have with our many partners and stakeholders. These partnerships are a big part of the success the EDC program has and it's had over the past 10 years. And we continue to value the relationships we built with our stakeholder organizations. We enjoyed our discussion back in April that helped refine the list of initiatives to advance. And today, we're pleased to be joined virtually by representatives of a few of our stakeholder organizations who will share their perspectives with us. Joining us today are Rich Giuliano, General Counsel of ARTBA, the American Road and Transportation Builders Association, Donna Shea, the Executive Director of the Connecticut Local Technical Assistance Program Center and immediate past president of the National LTAP Association, and Jim Tyman, the Executive Director of AASHTO, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. So let's first start with a fun two-part question that'll help us get to know you a little better. What drew you into the world of transportation 
And what is the most innovative thing you've done lately? And Rich, we can start with okay, you. Okay, great. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Well, great to be here. First of all, I wanna thank uh, the uh, agency's leadership for including us today and also for uh, great communication, particularly over the last six months and the extraordinary uh, uh, circumstances that the administrator was talking about. And, and uh, we have worked very closely with other groups and with FHWA leadership uh, during this time. So we appreciate that. Uh, as far as me personally, I guess uh, actually the names of two former secretaries of USDOT come to mind. Um, I spent a lot of time in Chicago uh, in state government and went to law school along the way and so forth and got to know Sam Skinner, who was the secretary under the first President Bush. Knew him a little bit before he came to DC actually when I was a very, very young person. And then uh, really got to know him after his uh, service at USDOT. So I was very aware of, um, of the department. And then in 2001, I had an opportunity to move out here to DOT and uh, took an appointment to work in Secretary uh, Norm Mineta's office. Um, so that's what really drew me to transportation. I think those of you who know Secretary Mineta realize he's one of the all time experts on transportation policy in the history of the nation probably. Uh, so spending time around him was really like a graduate seminar in, in transportation policy and how the department worked and how the systems around the nation uh, worked as well. And of course I was there uh, during and after September 11th, 2001, unfortunately. So the uh, following year had a chance to come here to ARTBA and I've specialized a little bit more in uh, particular transportation issues uh, in the 18 years uh, since then. So that's my own journey um, and uh, something that uh, I'm really grateful for to have uh, worked with all these great people and, and continue to learn every day. Uh, as far as innovation, um, I would say probably, you know, I, I could, I could uh, cite something like going to the, to the front of the house and pulling in the Amazon packages every day, something like that, that everybody's ordering in my house every single day, literally. Uh, but I will probably mention a, a plug for ARTBA. We have had a public-private partnerships conference for over 30 years. Um, and this year, like so many organizations, ASHTO and, and others, uh, decided to have a virtual conference. And it was very well done. We did it in July. Uh, our participants uh, stayed with us. They wanted to, uh, to be part of it, our panelists, our sponsors. And in particular, I would note that we had a lot of uh, public agency representatives, more than usual, who were able to attend. I think that's probably because they didn't have the travel costs associated with it and so forth. So we considered that a success. And uh, hopefully, we won't be doing virtual meetings forever. But uh, this one went very well. Great, thank you for that. Donna. Thank you, Mala. We're so happy to be here today. Um, but I do have a small confession that it wasn't actually transportation that, that drew me. Uh, adult learning is my passion. Um, but what I was and continue to be drawn to after 20 years um, are the people in the LTAP program whose passion inspires me every day um, and the wonderful people that we get to serve in the transportation community. Um, I have learned a lot about transportation over the, the 20 years, um, and it, it has been serendipity that it's really been the best best place for me to serve. Great. Thank you. Cool. I will say my innovation, though, is something very exciting. Um, I have found an innovative way to be virtual fatigue. Um, I stepped directly out of my comfort zone, and I'm actually learning to skull in a local rowing club. Um, which has been magic at the end of a very long day of Zoom. Um, and so you're never too old to learn to be innovative. And I even have my first race October 3rd. So. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Best wishes to you on that. <laughs> and how about you, Jim? Well, Mala, I, uh, I, I came into transportation through, uh, really through budgeting. Uh, you know, my first job in transportation was with the Office of Management and Budget, the, the White House Budget Office, where I worked as a program examiner on, on FHWA and, and Federal Transit Administration and, and uh, NHTSA and motor carrier issues. Uh, and from there, uh, made my 
the way up to Capitol Hill and spent about a dozen years working uh, on policy issues for the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Uh, I don't know if that would have been the career I mapped out, you know, coming out of grad school uh, 25 years ago or so, but uh, I, I love transportation. It's, uh, it's a great field to be in, uh, and it's really been good to me. It's, uh, it's just, as, as the Secretary said, I, I firmly believe that transportation is, uh, is the backbone of our nation's economy, and I think uh, being able to work in an, in an industry, in an area uh, where that's touching people's lives every day is, uh, is really motivating uh, to be able to, you know, get you out of bed every morning to, to get to work uh, or to, to get to this virtual environment uh, where we're working uh, remotely, so many of us. So uh, from an innovation standpoint, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, Rich kind of stole my thunder there. I was going to talk about Ashto's uh, efforts on the, on the virtual meeting front as well. Uh, it's been really an interesting six months uh, in having the, to, to kind of a transition to this virtual environment. And I think uh, the organization and the state DOT community uh, have really done a phenomenal job in, in, uh, in utilizing these virtual meeting platforms to still do the great work that we traditionally do in person. And, uh, you know, we have our annual meeting coming up uh, in November. I believe it's uh, the week of November 9th. And then we're starting to gear up for that now. And uh, it's interesting because I think uh, it's a lot more work to do some of these virtual meetings than it is to actually pull one off in person because uh, there's a lot more that goes into it from a planning and a, and a technical standpoint. Thanks, Jim. Clearly, transportation draws people from all backgrounds, and we're glad you, you all are in transportation. really strengthens the industry. Um, so question number two. Of the initiatives selected for EDC6, Tell us a little bit about one or two of them that you are really excited about and the ones you think will resonate with your members. You want me to go again? Sure. Sure, okay, thanks, Mala. Uh, I think the first one that comes to mind is the, uh, the workforce development. And this is really a, a continuation of a partnership that uh, some of our groups have had going back about five or six years, the Highway Construction Workforce Partnership, uh, ASHTO, ARTPA, Associated General Contractors of America and Federal Highway Administration, Department of Labor have all been involved in this. Um, and uh, in recent years, we had 12 uh, pilot states or, or localities where we were trying to match up the needs of the uh, highway construction industry with the workforce development resources there through the workforce investment boards or, or other entities. Now, obviously, a lot has changed in recent months. So previously, we were in a full employment situation virtually in the United States, and we were competing with other industries. And, and you know, what there, there's obviously continues to be a generational shift. People are retiring and so forth. Uh, from the industry and from the public agencies as well. Um, so that has changed. Now we have people who are unemployed, who are underemployed. Um, we certainly uh, continue to have a, a priority of diversity and inclusion uh, as well and trying to draw people into the industry who have been underrepresented. But we think that the uh, but that, that program, that initiative can be uh, shaped uh, for those objectives, uh, again, to bring good people in who can achieve long-term careers working in the industry. And, and the other uh, one that comes to mind is the e-ticketing and digital as-builts. Again, pr very prescient looking at e-ticketing before the pandemic started, uh, because there have been a lot of developments on it in recent months. You know, at ARTBA, we've been tracking since March, as many of you know, we've been tracking project developments on the state level uh, relating to the pandemic. And by my count, at least eight states have initiated e-ticketing programs, really for safety and health reasons, convenience, and so forth. Uh, there are probably more than that uh, in the last six months. And uh, it's something that we welcome. Now, it's not a, you know, we, we don't want to pile on too much data into, into, this, uh, into this situation. It needs to start with some limits, but uh, something that I think we welcome, and again, that we think is uh, very well-timed. Thank you. How about you, Donna? 
how many in this in this round have applicability to local agencies, but a few that I'm very excited about. Uh, the first one is the next generation of Tim. Um, the opportunity to put a focus on this to bring all stakeholders together around this important issue, um, I think, is critical. And uh, many of the LTAPs have already been advancing to Tim in our states through education and engagement. Um, and I think that this will be a perfect partnership to be able to, to advance this one. Of course, pavement overlay. Um, this particular topic is uh, near and dear to us um, in the local agencies. And, and I think that a national emphasis to EPC um, is just going to give us resources to be able to help in that area. One that, that I might not have, I might, you know, before COVID have thought a little differently about, but now has been you know, jettisoned to the, to the center is virtual public involvement. Um, you know, we're getting calls from local agencies all the time about how they can engage now. Um, and this particular topic, it was actually the very first technical briefing that we did post COVID um, shutdown was how do you engage through virtual public involvement. So um, I think that that's one that is, is going to be kind of a perfect connection um, and, and not, not in a way that I'm necessarily happy about. Um, but yeah, there's many that we're excited about in this round. Great. Thank you. And Jim. Well, you know, I would agree with, with Donna, really, from, for our first one, I would say it's virtual public involvement. I mean, uh, you know, since COVID has caused us uh, all to start working virtually, state DOTs have been testing out a, a lot of different ways to continue moving forward with uh, much needed transportation projects. Uh, and virtual public involvement is one of those areas that has garnered a lot of attention because of the need for the social distancing requirements, uh, that have been in place really for the last uh, six months or so. So uh, work on conducting public involvement in new ways uh, has been really helpful in advancing projects by allowing the planning and design process to continue. Uh, and in many cases, uh, they're even be able to, to reach a wider audience than we have in, in the past uh, using the, the, these virtual platforms. Uh, so we uh, we're really excited about that, and uh, and we anticipate that a lot of these strategies will actually continue even beyond the pandemic, uh, and, and we think we'll see more of an interest in, in other states and in, in picking up some of the lessons learned uh, from uh, virtual public involvement. Uh, you know, the second one I would point to is uh, is crowdsourcing for advancing operations. Uh, this is another area that's somewhat new for state DOTs, and and, and that we're uh, we have several states that are, have agreements with outside providers uh, of information to inform their incident management and traffic management centers. Uh, and that information that they're getting from these third parties can really help provide faster response to incidences and uh, help reduce congestion uh, and help really manage traffic in general. So uh, we're really excited about that as well. You know, one example there, uh, the Indiana DOT uses third-party probe data to actively manage traffic on, on some of their major highways and corridors. Uh, and they've worked with Purdue University to create uh, dashboard tools that really improved kind of their real-time operational decision-making. And I think that's a, just a great example of, of a state DOT, you know, working with a, a third party, and in this case with a, an academic institution to really find ways to, to optimize the, the work that they're doing from an operations stance. Mm -hmm. As the administrator said in her remarks, you know, all of these issues show that transportation is a nation on a move, on the move. We can, we don't stop. And I think you're right, Rich, uh, this was prescient because so many of these ideas are things that have been very helpful in this, in the COVID world, but they'll continue to be helpful. Uh, E-ticketing, obviously workforce development is going to be uh, critical and then virtual public involvement, certainly. So thank you for that. Okay, so the next one, next question. Given the EDC program's new tagline, a nation on the move, how do you think these initiatives can support national recovery efforts? Well, we need to continue growing transportation investment at ARTPA. That's the first thing we would tell you. And we know, you know, we work with Ashto and others uh, on that. Uh, we are continuing, for those of you who are not aware of it, we're continuing to be in a surface transportation reauthorization mode. We're hoping that uh, the, uh, and working towards a one-year extension of the FAST Act through uh, FY 2021 uh, by the end of this month. 
And the reason that I mention that is, you know, we are all advocates or should be advocates, maybe of different types uh, in whatever our respective roles are in different organizations or agencies. But we have said throughout the Everyday Counts, uh, the different iterations of it, that telling this story of these innovations, of these technologies is very helpful in advocacy. Uh, you know, the, the term shovel ready has been widely used in the past, and it's sort of unfortunate in some ways because there are connotations about exactly what the industry is and what these projects are about and so forth. If you look at the technology included in some of the seven innovations in EDC6 and several of them in the past, and we think that can be helpful and tell, and I mean, Jim especially can speak to this, having been on different sides of, uh, of the table for, for these kinds of discussions. But this can capture the imagination, mm -hmm. even of the general public. I remember when Massachusetts did that series of bridge replacements over the summer several years ago, and the general media and the general public became very interested in it. Uh, so that was a great message. And as far as workforce is concerned, reaching out again to the younger people, who, where technology has just been part of their lives from the beginning and showing them that this is a high tech industry and we are using these innovations, that's gonna help uh, as well. And I'll, and I'll put a third endorsement in for virtual public involvement and keeping projects moving while uh, complying with you know, th those requirements uh, for, for virtual input. But again, you know, as advocates, I think, uh, and, and leading the recovery through transportation investment, it can help in these ways. Great, thanks. Donna? I couldn't agree with Rich more. You know, as I was looking at the framework for EDC6, the words that kept jumping out at me were saving time, saving money, increasing engagement, um, and increasing engagement in a way that builds a strong workforce. And I think as we move forward to recover from these difficult times, any way that we can support those uh, for local agencies will be kind of a, a critical on our road to recovery. So true. Thank you. And Jim. So, uh, you know, I, I agree with everything that Rich and Donna have said, but I, I would also uh, go back to the virtual public involvement effort. I mean, given uh, what we were all facing, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, when really, you know, with the stay-at-home orders and, and, and a lot of uh, what we were dealing with as a society, uh, really had the opportunity to kind of uh, have a lot of these projects that were underway get stuck in their tracks. And, and I think virtual public involvement helped keep a lot of those projects moving. Uh, and without that, you know, I think that you would have lost, you know, six months or who, who knows how long uh, in the timeline of getting these projects moving and, and getting a, a shovel on the ground to move forward with them. And we all know uh, that we continue to struggle with ways to kind of streamline the project delivery process to, to make it um, easier for us to get these projects to, to, to move from conception to actual construction. So uh, I, I think virtual public involvement has been a, a real uh, key for us to be able to keep some of these projects that have been in the pipeline, in the pipeline moving forward. Uh, I would also say strategic workforce development, uh, that, that initiative uh, and how it relates with the Highway Construction Workforce Partnership pilot program that, uh, that Rich, is, Rich and I have both worked on here over the, a number of years. Uh, as Rich said, you know, we've got a, a number of people now that, that have found themselves suddenly out of work. Uh, and it really is, is kind of flipped the script on us a little bit in that before the pandemic, I mean, it was, it was tough to go out there and, and, and find folks uh, that were unemployed, that were looking for work. Uh, but now with this, uh, this uh, strategic workforce development initiative, I think it, it gives us that opportunity uh, to get some of those folks that are newly out of work trained into this new industry uh, and one that's always looking for skilled workforce. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Okay, so question four. An important legacy of the Everyday Counts program is the spotlight on safety which still is and always will be our primary mission with FHWA and the department's commitment to carrying this legacy forward into other initiatives and efforts. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the impact the EDC program has had on safety within your respective areas. And Rich, again, I'll start with you. Sure, of course. Well, as has been mentioned, just shortening project times 
and the time that workers have to be out there and the time that the traveling public has to go through work zones, just that in itself, which is the overall objective of these EDC uh, innovations is helpful. I mean, that I think that's obvious. Um, and I think, you know, I have colleagues here at ARPA who spend all their time on safety uh, programs. And they tell me that just having that as part of this discussion, you know, what we're doing now and the, the summits when you do those uh, year after year uh, and the different safety related innovations is very helpful because, you know, it, it, it's a continuing journey to improve safety, uh, to improve work zone safety in particular. Uh, it, it continues to be so. So we appreciate uh, those opportunities, and and again, I want to put in a plug for you know for pedestrian safety, which has been a an initiative and a continuing initiative, of Federal Highway, and other agencies. And we have talked to the leadership at FHWA about the importance of of uh, workers, highway construction workers, and inspectors and others, and including them. You know, they're on their feet in the, in the work zones as well and including them in the equation too. So we've had some good conversations about that. So these are all the things that are part of this dialogue that we think are very positive. Thank you. Donna? Well, over the years, EDC has provided our LTAP community with resources and placed a national emphasis on safety priorities that really encourage local agencies to take a leadership role in safety. So in, as a couple of, there's so many examples, but as a couple of examples, in the state of Connecticut where I am, a local agency was the very first one to install a safety edge. You know, they stepped out, they didn't wait for the state to do it, they just did it on their own through us encouraging them through our educational program. In Washington state, so many local agencies embraced high friction surface treatments, which was a direct result of EDC2 efforts. So I really think that the strong partnerships, when I think particularly about safety, the strong partnerships our community has built with the FHWA Office of Safety, the Resource Center experts, I mean, they're so solid that I think we'll be able to advance many opportunities for things like STEP, the Safe Transportation for Pedestrians, the Roadway Departure Work, Local Road Safety Plans, um, I think that we're going to keep this momentum going um, through the work that's already been done. Um, and a lot of it has to do with what's been done in EDC. And Jim. Well, uh, you know, I would focus maybe on a, a couple of the initiatives that Donna mentioned. Uh, you know, the, for us, for state DOTs, uh, some of the initiatives from the Safe Transportation for Every Pedestrian uh, initiative have been really important. Uh, the pedestrian gateway treatment is is one in particular uh, that was uh, part of also ASHTO's in, uh, innovation initiative efforts. Uh, and it's been promoted at several of our ASHTO committee meetings as well. And, uh, and this treatment has really been shown to increase safety of crosswalks and uh, provide more visibility where pedestrians are crossing and narrowing the travel lane uh, to slow vehicles and, and really uh, you know, yielding an, an, an increase in, in the level of safety in those instances. Um, I would also say the Reducing road, Rural Roadway Departures Initiative uh, is, is another one that I think we've seen a lot of success from. Uh, you know, it's encouraging the implementation of systemic data-driven uh, roadway departure countermeasures, and, uh, and that's really important when we have about a third of our traffic, traffic fatalities that are occurring uh, on our rural roads. So, uh, we've been very lucky to have about 39 states that have either demonstrated or institutionalized these countermeasures during that two-year EDC period uh, for the uh, Reducing rural, rural Roadway Departures Initiative. Uh, and I think that shows uh, the, the success uh, of this initiative and, and the fact that state DOTs are really willing to, uh, to take some of the, uh, the uh, countermeasures that are developed through it and, and implement them. Again, as you know, Administrator Nason has always said, transportation is a team sport, and certainly that holds true for safety. Um, we're all in this together and we're all working to improve safety. So thank you very much for your insights. So we asked this of our state DOT partners at the regional summits in 2018, and the question still seems relevant today. How are you or your organizations empowering your member communities to become the successful new generation of practitioners and leaders? And also, how do you integrate being innovative into the mix? 
Well, first, we appreciate that EDC is a state-based program. It's not a prescriptive program. It's about raising awareness of and promoting innovations. And that mirrors what we do in many ways as a national association in this area, because we're not going to go as art, but to a state and say, you should be doing this or that or, or whatever in terms of your policies. But we seek to educate our members and our, our state chapters, our affiliated chapters out there so they can be part of that conversation with their state DOT and, and other public officials. Um, so we appreciate that. And a number of our chapters are, are members of the, the sticks out there uh, that have been uh, um, uh, active in, in many states over the years. So we uh, appreciate that uh, as well. I would say uh, organizationally uh, at ARPA, we've done a few things. We have had a, a workshop called Transovation, obviously a, a, a mashup of transportation and innovation that we've done for, for several years uh, now. And it has been led by some of our younger members um, and you know realizing that in a trade association, a lot of folks involved are sort of more of the senior management, which is great, but we have all along wanted uh, some of the emerging leaders in the industry to be involved. And this is an issue, technology, innovation, and workforce, by the way, have all been issues that they've been particularly interested in and they have helped lead our organization on. So we do that. Um, and we also have started uh, just uh, recently uh, some policy forums uh, in three categories, construction, safety, and innovation and technology. And collectively, those really cover everything that you've been looking at in EDC. And that's, a, again, a chance for our members to participate and, uh, and join us in, in shaping policy and giving us feedback on all this. So I think that's what it's all about, is giving them a voice and, and breaking down barriers to participation. And, and we learn from our members around the country in that way. Fantastic, thank you. Donna. Two things really stand out in my mind about this, this question. The first is that we work very hard in our state to be able to encourage, to recognize, and reward innovation on the local level. Um, I'm sure many people have heard about our, our you know, each of our states has a Build a Better Mousetrap program. Um, you know, for these local agencies to get this kind of recognition encourages innovation. And, it also helps them understand that a, a $20 solution that saves their local agency time and money um, is innovation. It definitely would fall in the category of innovation. Um, and that just encourages them and inspires them to, to think more creatively. The other thing too is that we weave uh, through our educational programs, um, you know, ideas that are building innovative leaders of the future. Um, you know, through our transportation leadership programs and our opportunity to work with them on critical thinking. Um, you know, I think we're weaving this so that when you see the future leaders in public works and transportation, um, they're going to be more innovative uh, through our efforts. And I think that that will just support all of this work. Fantastic. Thank you. And Jim. So, Molly, I think that, uh, you know, state DOTs have traditionally been the, the laboratories for innovation, right? I mean, this is where we see, I think, some of the more innovative uh, approaches being being adopted. And uh, it's great to see this partnership between uh, FHWA and, and state and local agencies to be able to uh, inspire innovation like that. Uh, you know, we, at right now, I think every state DOT in the country has established a, uh, a state transportation innovation council, a stick, as, as Rich was mentioning it. And many DOTs have hired a lead person to serve uh, in the capacity of, of solely promoting and advancing innovation within their department. So, you know, I think we're seeing this not only just happen organically, but it's being, I think, woven into the fabric of, of the culture of these state DOTs as well. And I think that's a, a big step forward uh, for our whole industry. Um, you know, I would also say from, from an internal standpoint, uh, ASHTO has had our uh, ASHTO Innovation Initiative for almost 20 years now. Uh, and this group goes out and promotes new market-ready solutions uh, for problems that, that transportation agencies are experiencing. Uh, and if we look back, you know, 20 years ago to some of the innovative uh, products and, and solutions that, that, the, uh, that this program identified back then, I mean, in 2001, 
uh, prefabricated bridge elements and, and ITS in, in work zones were, were two of the things that we were uh, promoting and trying to advance. And now those are pretty much commonplace uh, across the country. So I think it shows that uh, exercises like this, where we're trying to identify innovations out there and then spread the word on how well they work, uh, those things work and they, and they have a real impact on our industry and on the state DOT community. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate that. And so that about does it with our time. And, you know, again, we are so pleased to have you join us today. So thank you all again for your insights, your perspectives, um, very invaluable. And I truly enjoyed it. And I know that our uh, virtual audience does as well. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mal. Okay, so with a few minutes left, it's now my pleasure to introduce Federal Highway Executive Director, Tom Everett. Tom is going to provide some closing remarks and share some information about what's in store as we continue our rollout. Tom. Thank you, Mala, and hello, everyone. Good to see you all. If you are a veteran of past EDC rollouts, uh, you, you know that we've taken a different approach this year with this launch, and uh, we certainly would appreciate the feedback any thoughts or comments you may have on this uh, virtual approach, as always, would be welcome. As far as what is coming next, let me, let me start uh, before I get into my comments and say, if you have any questions, we have a little bit of time. Uh, so go ahead and put them in the Q&A chat pod. There's a, a chat pod labeled Q&A. You should see that on your screen. And uh, assuming I can get through my comments here, finally, uh, we'll, we'll take uh, some questions that are posted there, so, so go ahead and use that. We are uh, super excited, as you heard the administrator say earlier, to be able to conduct our EDC summits virtually this year. One drawback uh, to the previous way we've done the in-person EDC summits is that there is a limit to the number of participants. And having this virtual summit enables us to really welcome more participation from all of our partners, state DOTs, local agencies, federal land management agencies, tribes, industry, to share experiences and lessons learned. We can reach a larger audience um, this way, so there's a plus to, to doing this virtually. And that's, getting that feedback from all those different parties is especially important to us. As we, as we saw uh, when we polled the audiences in our 2018 summits, Many participants were there for the first time. So we're, we're really looking forward to engaging even more new participants about the benefits of the EDC innovations in this virtual setting. I can assure you that we will still have a chance to engage uh, with each other. That we've, we've figured that out using virtual tools that there's a way to still, to still engage and get that engagement um, that you can get in an in-person meeting. As a new feature this time, one that we are very excited about, is the showcase of homegrown innovations that have been successfully deployed across the country. We anticipate the summit to take place in November. We're tidying up the final details right now, so uh, please be patient while we do that. And then we will get some more information out about the summit on our EDC website by early October. Registration will be free, and if you can't attend, all the information will be available on demand. I want to uh, borrow a remark the administrator uses periodically, and I heard Mala mention it earlier, that transportation is a team sport. That really resonates in a lot of what we do, and it is certainly true for what we've been able to accomplish with the Everyday Counts uh, program since the very beginning. You, you all have always played a very big part in our deployment teams, and your commitment to sharing your experience and expertise with your peers is a big reason why Everyday Counts has, has led to so many long-lasting positive impacts in how we do our business. And it really has fostered a culture of innovation. If you think back to when we started this, um, that was the phrase we were throwing around, is really need a culture of innovation for this to succeed. And, and now looking back, I'd say we, we've got that. We're there. We, we now need to just 
uh, continue to foster that culture and uh, feed it and nurture it and then continue to be innovative and apply those innovations in what we do. Uh, just like with anything else really that's team oriented, your successes at local levels lead to greater successes being achieved um, on a larger scale at the national level. And that's really what Everyday Counts is all about. So uh, thank you once again. Let me uh, pause and just check to see if we have any, any questions in the chat pod. Um, and maybe I will pose this to the panelists. So there's one question that I see. It says, uh, with data volumes increasing, how has your organization enhanced data management governance and where would you like to see it in the future? So this gets to the issue of cybersecurity and all the data that's now available. And, you know, with, I'm guessing with automation of vehicles and, and our transportation infrastructure, um, the, the management of data. Maybe let me call on Jim to maybe talk about that a little bit because I'm pretty sure you're hearing that and talking about that topic with your your stakeholders, the state DOTs. Well, you know, Tom, when I saw this come up, I figured you were going to be coming to me on this. So, uh, yeah, look, this is uh, this this is a challenge, I think, for a lot of state DOTs. Uh, you know, I think the good news is is that we're making progress on it uh, internally within Ashto. Uh, we actually. Uh, established a new committee on uh, data and management analytics, uh, specifically because of the issue that, uh, that David raises here in this question. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had uh, a platform for state DOTs to be able to come together and discuss some of the challenges that they were having uh, with regards to data management and governance. And, uh, and we're about three years into that committee being in existence, and I think we're seeing real progress. Uh, I'd also bring up that this is a workforce issue, I think, for a lot of state DOTs as well, uh, because this is not, uh, you know, one of those typical position descriptions that state DOTs have had to fill in the past. And uh, it's taken, I think, some work for state DOTs to go out there and uh, figure out how they need to be staffed up to be able to address these issues. Uh, I think we're making great progress in that area. And, uh, but to some extent, it's a workforce issue as well. Uh, and you know, I would say before the pandemic, it was, it's been hard for state DOTs to compete uh, with people that have the expertise in this area because they're in such high demand across all industries. Thank you, Jim. I see Rich, you turned your camera on. Donna, I don't know if you have anything to add on that topic. Well, Tom, I, I would just add um, that when I saw the question, the first thing I thought about were the partnerships that were developing in the states, particularly around data needs, not so much cybersecurity, but, although I think that's a very important issue, is you know, for us in the LTAP community, us working with our DOTs that are doing a lot of work in data integration and also working with our uh, university partners that are doing an incredible amount in, in data management. Um, is in our way to be able to provide local agencies with the data that they're going to need to support these contingency efforts. So I think it's it's going to be so critical that we have partnerships in all this area, including cybersecurity. And and as it gets into issues about who owns the data, how much data is there out there? As I mentioned earlier, you know, as far as e-ticketing is concerned, I mean, let's. Uh, let's maybe put some limits on what we're collecting and, and build that over time. But this issue is obviously going to become more and more prevalent with automated vehicles, connected vehicles, uh, perhaps different forms of funding for transportation coming up that are, you know, a lot of this is going to be connected to, uh, to data issues. So it will continue to be prevalent. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Donna. I see another uh, comment. Uh, I'm surprised that uh, there's not a safety initiative. I guess from Federal Highway's perspective, uh, just because it may not be prominent in EDC doesn't mean safety is still our top priority. And in fact, a lot of the other initiatives that we've got um, going that originated with EDC, uh, we're still keeping our foot on the accelerator. So uh, don't, don't look at that as a signal of safety being any less important. Uh, it's certainly not. Uh, 
much. So I just wanted to comment on that. I think just looking at the clock. And um, can I, I comment on that too, real quickly? Oh, yeah, please, Administrator. I appreciate what you said. First of all, I want to thank the panelists. That was a terrific discussion, and we really appreciate your thoughtfulness and your participation in this event. Um, we had some discussion about do we need to specifically include uh, pedestrian safety, and I do agree that it's a priority. I agree with the comment that um, you know fatalities are at a 30-year high for our most vulnerable road users, but to Tom's point, safety is top of mind for everyone at this agency. And I think after some discussion, we decided we don't need to keep proving that. Everyone should know. And everyone in this industry always puts safety first. And particularly right now with pedestrian safety, uh, it's been a huge focus for the agency. And, and I agree as we're all home, as uh, kids are doing virtual school and parents are trying to work from home, everybody wants to get out. I think the one thing that we've probably all seen uh, from here to Connecticut, Donna, is, People need to get outside. They're just, they're Zoom fatigued. And so they're, they're out in the streets. They're riding their bikes. They're walking children in strollers. They're walking their dogs. Now more than ever, I feel like we need to continue to focus on pedestrian safety. We did three virtual uh, pedestrian safety summits this summer. And I thank those of you who participate in that. We have a pedestrian safety action plan coming out in October. And NHTSA has designated October pedestrian safety month. So that is something that I, I agree is going to have to be a priority for this organization well into next year and beyond. We have seen several uh, major American companies announce they are not bringing their employees back to work until mid-year next year or even summer. So uh, we know that desire to get outside is, is going to be everywhere. And I just hope that uh, everyone continues to make pedestrian safety a priority into next year. And I hope it's something that we can talk about a lot with Congress as we look for, finally, a long-term reauthorization bill. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, thank you, Administrator. Appreciate you jumping in there. Uh, one, one last question that I saw that I will try to address here is related to UHPC. Why was it included in EDC6? Been around for a while, so what's new? And I really think um, what's new is the applications, right? We're learning more and more where we can use UHPC effectively. And also just looking at its implementation, I don't know that we're uh, where we would like to be um, in, in that area. I think there are opportunities for greater use. And so that was part of the decision as well. But just more, more applications as we get into using UHPC, I think we're we're learning more about where it could potentially offer them. So uh, let me let me leave it there. And out of respect for everyone's time, we're pretty much up against uh, 3.30. Let me just thank again our panelists. I thought that conversation, your insights were terrific. So Rich, Donna, Jim, really appreciate your taking time to, to support Everyday Counts and, and uh, offer your thoughts today. And uh, thanks to Mala, our wonderful MC today. Did a great job. And I thank everyone for, for joining us. I saw over 600 participants at one point, so that's terrific. And I look forward to uh, meeting with you all again very soon. Uh, it'd be great to see you all face to face, and I'm um, looking forward to whenever, whenever that day comes. And thank you all again. That concludes today's event. I hope you all have a great rest of the week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the Federal Highway Administration's Everyday Counts Executive Session. Thank you for attending and please have a safe and wonderful day.